This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Last week I brought a message to you entitled, The Greatest Mystery. And the the message itself last week was about the mystery of the church. How that God had planned before the foundation of the world that He would incorporate not only the Jew, but also the Gentile into His plan of redemption for mankind. That not only would He open up the plan of salvation to all of mankind, including us Gentiles, but that He would even use us Gentiles to propagate that message, to give out the plan of salvation, the mystery of the church. And of course, the greatest mystery to me is that God would choose even me to be part of that plan. And I'm sure if you're saved, you feel the same about your own testimony as well. But I want to bring you a message this morning about another mystery found in the Word of God. If you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as I read our text found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. Here's what the Apostle Paul says, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I want to go back to verse 51. It's our primary text for the morning. Listen again to what the Apostle Paul said, writing to Christians. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for the next few minutes that you would allow our minds and hearts to be focused not upon the other things going on in life, but upon you, upon your word, and specifically this morning, upon the promise that you've given in these verses. Lord, may our lives be different than they were when we walked in this morning. Lord, may we realize like never before the beauty of the promise revealed in this passage. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we ask it. Amen. And you may be seated. A mystery. As I said last week in our introduction, mystery is a secret. It's something that's not yet revealed. It's something that's not known. It's the unknown. That's what makes it a mystery. And I talked last week in the introduction about growing up and reading books and watching movies, and you can still see them today and read them today, of mystery stories. The whodunits. Everybody loves a mystery, as the old saying goes, because we all like to find out something new, something we didn't know before. Maybe even something that no one knew before. That's one of the things as a teacher that I have always loved about learning is that learning is a mystery because every day that you walk in and you sit down in the classroom or the Sunday school class or You just pick up a book at home and read it for yourself. When you see something you've never seen before, it's just like one of those mystery stories. Something being revealed that you didn't know before. And last week we looked at the mystery of the church. That God would use both Jew and Gentile. In the Old Testament it looked like it was just about the Jews, the children of Israel. And we Gentiles were all left out of the program somehow. But the beauty of it is that as we saw last week, not only were we 
part of the program, but that God chose us to be part of the program before the foundation of the earth was laid. What a beautiful mystery, the mystery of the church. But the mystery we have this morning is no less beautiful than the mystery of the church. And it is a mystery that the Apostle Paul revealed to the church at Corinth in this passage, in these two verses, something that before his letter that we know as 1 Corinthians, these Christians at the church in Corinth did not know. It was an unknown to them. In fact, you know, one of the most interesting things sometimes is to see people who think they know what they're talking about when not only do they not know what they're talking about, but they don't know what it is that they don't know yet. And yet that's the way it was with the church at Corinth on this subject. Not only did they not know about it, but they didn't even know what they didn't yet know that was to come. The mystery this week, as the Apostle Paul said in verse 51, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The word sleep is not talking about lying down, closing your eyes, reclining for a little while and taking a nap or sleeping through the night and getting up the next day. That's not the kind of sleep that the Apostle Paul is speaking of here. When the Apostle Paul says, we shall not all sleep, he's talking about death. He's talking about dying. The mystery is that we're not all going to have to die, but we're all going to be changed. There are plenty of examples in the Bible where the, the term sleep is used synonymously with death. There are examples in the Old Testament and examples in the New Testament. It's an analogy for death. It's a metaphor for death. In 1 Kings 2 verse 10, King David refers to death as sleeping. In the story of Lazarus in the New Testament, Jesus told the disciples before they went to Lazarus, He said, uh, Lazarus is sleeping. And they thought he meant that he was taking of sleep in rest. But the Bible says next, Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. So you see the word sleep is used as a metaphor for death throughout the Bible. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians, the same book in which we're reading our text this morning, Paul said in chapter 11, verse 30, speaking of those who had participated in the Lord's Supper with known sin in their life, without getting their, their lives cleaned up and made right before they participated in communion, the Lord's Supper, he said, many of you are weak and sickly, and many of you sleep because of this. That is because they had partaken of the Lord's Supper unworthily with sin in their lives that had not been confessed before partaking of the Lord's Supper. Sleep. It's synonymous in those instances with death. It's a metaphor for dying. So the mystery Paul reveals here is that we shall not all sleep, that is, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. Well, preacher, where's the mystery there? Well, the mystery that's previously unrevealed is that not all believers are going to have to die. But we're all going to get our glorified bodies that are fit for eternity. You see, previously there was a belief in a bodily resurrection, but there was no belief in the rapture of the church without death. Christians who were alive and walking around, being snatched up from here and taken up to glory and getting a glorified body without having to even taste of death. There was no understanding of that. 
There was no knowledge of the rapture of the church. Well, preacher, the rapture, the word rapture is not even mentioned in the Bible. Uh, you uh, fundamental independent Baptists that take the Bible literally, you talk about the rapture, but the word rapture is nowhere found in the Bible. Well, no, the word rapture is not found in the Bible, but the concept of the rapture is found in the Bible. It's not only found in the passage that we just read, it's found in another passage we'll read in just a little while, when Paul revealed the same mystery to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he describes the rapture of the church. There are other things, by the way, that are mentioned in the Bible, of which you could also say the word is not there. Well, there's the hypostatic union of Christ. Preacher, what is that? Well, that's a great big 10-cent theological term, meaning that Jesus is both 100% God and 100% man at the same time. He's the perfect God-man. But you won't find the term hypostatic union of Christ in the Bible. But it's a principle that's taught in the Bible nonetheless. So too is the rapture of the church. It's taught in the Bible. The word rapture may not be there, but the concept is there. And the mystery that had never been revealed before until God gave it to Paul and Paul gave it to the church is that all believers are not going to have to face death before getting their glorified body. Now, are most believers going to have to taste death before they get their glorified body? Yes, it's just a simple truth that most believers, even in the church age, are going to taste death before they get their glorified body. Brother John, I love walking through our cemetery out back. Uh, it's a, one of the most beautiful cemeteries. It's very well kept. Uh, it's green. It's beautiful. The trees and the, the bushes that are planted out there there are multiplied millions upon millions of believers just going back to the cross that have already died and their, their physical bodies been buried in the grave and they're going to get a glorified body. The majority of believers are not going to get to receive their glorified body without tasting death. But some of us are. Some of us. Preacher, you said us. Does that mean uh, we that are here right now? You, the preacher? You know what? I don't know the answer to that. You don't know the answer to that. The Bible says not even the Son knows when the Father is going to turn to Him and say, go and get your bride. But what I do know is that because God revealed this mystery to Paul, and Paul revealed this mystery to the church, that is the church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica, and to Pinnacle Baptist Church, the mystery is there's coming a day when not all of us will have to taste of death to get our glorified bodies. I'm looking forward to the glorified body. Miss Mary, the older I get, and the more tired and sore this body gets when I do things that I enjoy doing, the more I'm looking forward to that glorified body. The body that doesn't get tired, the body that doesn't get sick anymore, doesn't have aches and pains and all those things, it's fit to last for all eternity. I'm looking forward to that body. Now, I like this body, and I enjoy it, and I enjoy getting outside. Working outside uh, around the property is one of my favorite things to do. But I have to confess, the next morning when I get up, I don't enjoy it quite so much as I did the day before when I was out there doing whatever I was doing. But there's coming a day when I'm going to get a glorified body that is fit, that is intended for all eternity. Won't wear out, doesn't need a warranty with it. It's just going to last forever in just as good a shape as the day that you got it. But normally death is required to free a person's soul and spirit from this body after all, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. That's the normal course of life, is that we're all supposed to experience death as a general rule before we get that glorified body. In fact, in the Bible, there are only two men 
that are mentioned by name that, as far as we know, they have never yet died. One is Enoch, who the Bible says in the book of Genesis was translated. That is, he was raptured up. He was walking along one day, and all of a sudden, he was not, the Bible says, for God took him. He just was on earth one day, and the next thing, he was uh, in the presence of God, or he was in Abraham's bosom, but Enoch did not have to taste of death. The other man is also from the Old Testament, and that's Elijah. He's the one, as you might recall, just before he, uh, uh, well, right after he passed the mantle of his ministry on to Elisha, Elijah was down there, and uh, lo and behold, there was a whirlwind uh, with a, a flaming chariot that came down out of heaven, grabbed him up, whisked him away, and as far as we know, Enoch and Elijah are the only two men that have never tasted of death up to this point. By the way, I think there's a very good possibility that those two men may be the ones that are spoken of in the book of Revelation when it talks about the fact that there will be two witnesses uh, that will go throughout the streets of Jerusalem and the land of Israel teaching and preaching the gospel when those 144,000 young Jewish men that are all virgins get saved and become evangelists during the tribulation period. So maybe that's why Enoch and Elijah were spared and God did not allow them to taste of death yet because we do know that during that incident in the tribulation period, when their ministry has come to an end, God will allow the beast, that is the Antichrist, to strike down those two witnesses of the Lord. They will die. In fact, the Bible says that their dead bodies will lie in the streets of Jerusalem for three days before they are immediately resurrected and raptured up to heaven. If you don't know that story, you should have been here during our study in the book of Revelation. Next time we go through that study, you can catch it with the rest of us. But normally, death is required to free the person's soul and spirit from the body. But Paul said, I share with you a mystery. That's not going to be true of everyone. It's not going to be that we all have to die, but we will all be changed. You know what that means? That means that some of us are not going to have to taste of death. Some of us are not going to die. Now, Paul said this almost 2,000 years ago. Were there people there in the church at Corinth who were thinking, you know, I wonder if I'm one of the ones that's still going to be around when the rapture of the church takes place and uh, we're taken up to glory, we get our glorified body without having to die. I wonder if I'm going to be one of the ones. And you know what? They weren't one of the ones. So you ask the question, preacher, are we going to be some of those ones that don't have to taste of death, and we're going to be raptured up and get our glorified bodies without having to die as well? I don't know the answer to that for me or you, either one. But some... Christians, some believers at some point are going to get their glorified body without having to taste of death. That's kind of exciting to think about. But here's what I want to do for just the next few minutes. I want to take the the excitement of that and set it over here and we'll come back to it at the end. I want to kind of explain why this was such a mystery to the believers that were hearing this news when Paul revealed it to them. When Paul first revealed the mystery to these Christians at the church in Corinth in the letter that he wrote them, why was it a mystery? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the Bible and let's recount why they believed what they believed. Why did they believe that Yes, they were going to get a new body, a glorified body, a resurrected body, but they did not know that there were some who would get one without having to die first. So let's go back to the beginning. 
The Old Testament saints believed in a literal, bodily resurrection for the redeemed. Did you hear me? That is the Old Testament saints, not the New Testament. But even the Old Testament saints knew there was going to be a a bodily resurrection and that believers would one day get a new body. And that they would have a new body for all eternity. Well, preacher, I don't remember reading that anywhere in the Bible. I don't remember reading that in the Old Testament. Well, in Job chapter 19, which, by the way, the book of Job has some very interesting things in it. If you've never read it slowly and studied it, you ought to take time just to study the book of Job. Um, About a year or so ago, Brother Alex did a Sunday school lesson that was taken from Uh, one of the chapters in the book of Job. It was an exciting Sunday school lesson, and uh, maybe sometime we ought to do a a study through the whole book. But there are some exciting things in the book of Job. Listen to what uh, the Bible says in Job 19, verse 26. Job said, beginning in verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now here is Job talking about in the end times, he knows that his Redeemer is going to be here on the earth. Who's his Redeemer? His Redeemer is Jesus. His Redeemer is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. This is Job writing this way back in the Old Testament, In fact, there are some who believe that the book of Job may be the earliest written book of the Bible. That is, that he wrote the book of Job before Moses ever wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, if that be the case, the book of Job is an old book. That would put it at least 3,000 years old, maybe older than that. But Job said, writing in the Old Testament, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. What are skin worms? Well, they're those creepy crawlies that cause this body to break down and decay once it's put in the ground and buried. And Job said, After the worms have eaten my body... Yet in my flesh shall I see God. You see, the Old Testament believers who trusted God knew, understood, and believed that they would receive a literal, physical body in the next world, in the next life, for all eternity. Those who would have us to believe that Old Testament saints didn't know anything about heaven and hell and the end times They just don't know their Bibles. Because Job very plainly understood that. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. We have no idea what all God shared with Adam and Eve back then. He talked with them after they were kicked out of the Garden. He talked with Noah. He talked with Enoch. He talked with others of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. We have no idea how much they did know about all that you and I know from the New Testament that was revealed to us. But this we know. The Old Testament saints believed in a literal bodily resurrection for the redeemed. In fact, you might remember that in Jesus' day and time in the New Testament, that was one of the reasons there was a great disagreement between the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Israel. The Sadducees were the liberals of their day, and they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection from the dead. They didn't believe in angels the way we believe in angels. They didn't believe in a lot of spiritual things that you and I know the Bible teaches. They were the skeptics and the scoffers of their day. The Pharisees, meanwhile, they were the ones who, in spite of all their faults, they did at least believe in a literal reading of the Old Testament Word of God. And the Pharisees believed there would be a bodily resurrection one day. A literal, physical, bodily resurrection. 
You might remember in our study in the book of Acts how the Apostle Paul used that to his advantage when he was being accused of being a blasphemer for preaching that Jesus rose from the dead. And he turned that around and said, well, I'm being accused of believing something that I as a Pharisee was taught growing up, that there is a resurrection of the dead. And of course, the rest of the Pharisees chimed in and said, well, yes, there is going to be a bodily resurrection of the dead. So number one, I submit to you, Old Testament saints believe that there is going to be a literal, physical, bodily resurrection from the dead one day for the redeemed. Number two, the Old Testament saints also knew of the Lord returning with His saints one day. They knew that at the end times, God the Son, God in the flesh, was going to return to the earth. You and I recall, uh, we regard it as the second coming of Christ. In the book of Jude, which is one of the shortest books of the Bible, as soon as I can get to the verse, I'm going to read it. It's just before the book of Revelation. In Jude, verse 14, listen to what the Bible says. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. So, the Old Testament saints not only believed in a literal bodily resurrection, but the Old Testament saints also knew that at some point in the future, at the end times, the Lord was going to return to earth with His saints. With them. That is, they would have to have some type of body if they were coming back from glory with Him. That is, if saints had already died, their bodies had been buried in the ground, they must have some kind of body if they're coming back with Him at the end time. So the Old Testament saints not only believed in a bodily resurrection, they believed that they were coming back with the Lord one day. Number three, the Old Testament saints knew of the coming tribulation period. They didn't all understand the church age in which we live, but they all knew about the coming tribulation period. Because the Jewish scriptures of the Old Testament say much about the coming tribulation period in many books of the Old Testament. It was in the book of Daniel that the tribulation is referred to by Daniel as the time of Jacob's sorrow, as the time of trouble such as never was. Preacher, how bad is the tribulation going to be? It's going to be so bad that it'll be worse than it's ever been before. It's hard to beat that. And the Old Testament saints knew that there's a coming tribulation period. And that Israel was going to be the subject of much of the persecution during the tribulation period. In fact, you and I who were in the study of the book of Daniel just a couple of years ago here on Sunday nights, as we recounted some of the prophecies given in the book of Daniel, we saw that historically there was a man in 168 B.C. named Antiochus Epiphanes who was a type or a picture or a foreshadowing of the coming Antichrist in the, old, in the end times. And I don't know if those of you that were here that night remember or not, but In recounting the story, Antiochus Epiphanes, this this ruler before the birth of Christ, went into the land of Israel seeking to exterminate, annihilate as many of the Jews as he could. And in three days, he had over 40,000 Jews killed in the land of Israel. These were not just men of war. He had men, women, elderly, and infants. 
butchered, massacred, killed. 40,000 in three days' time that were killed by that one man alone from history. So when the children of Israel, when the Old Testament saints thought about the tribulation period, they knew there was a time coming when they, the saints of God, would be targeted, would be persecuted. They knew that was still off in the future. The Old Testament saints also knew of the coming kingdom age that would come after that tribulation period though. The kingdom age, we call it the millennial reign of Christ. You have the seven years of tribulation followed by the coming of the Lord with ten thousands of His saints. Followed by Jesus taking His rightful place sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem and ruling the entire earth for a thousand years in the millennial reign. The prophet Isaiah spoke about the kingdom of the Lord. The prophet Isaiah talked about much of the curse being removed from the earth during that kingdom age. If you go back and you read in, in the book of Isaiah, you can read in chapter 14 about God removing much of the curse even to the point that the animals that are predators of one another will lie down together. That the lion will eat straw like an ox. Much of the curse that came upon creation because of man's sin in the garden, much of the curse is going to be lifted from the earth. Because Jesus, the Creator, the Redeemer, will be sitting on the throne of David, ruling the earth as the king of the earth for a thousand years. He's the one that made everything. If He chooses to release some of the curse that was brought upon the earth because of sin, He's entitled to do it. Not only is He the Creator, but He's the one whose blood redeemed mankind. And not only redeemed mankind, but redeemed all of creation from the results of sin. Also, in the book of Isaiah, we read about during that kingdom age that there will be long life to those that are alive. In fact, the book of Isaiah tells us that during that time that you and I know as the millennial reign of Christ, a child shall be as a hundred years old. That means if you're a hundred years old, you're still just a child during the millennium. That means people are going to begin to live a lot longer, just like they did before the flood. And before the multiplied effects of sin after the fall. The Old Testament saints knew other things of the coming kingdom age. The book of Zechariah talks about Jesus sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. The book of Jeremiah talks about nations coming up to worship Jesus as He sits on the throne. So Old Testament saints knew something of the coming kingdom age after the tribulation. Well, preacher, where are you going with all of this? Yes, these are all things that the Old Testament saints knew, but where are you going with this? What I'm trying to get you to see is that the Old Testament saints knew a lot more than what we typically give them credit for having known, but what they could not have seen. What they could not have known was what Paul revealed. That we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Even knowing all the Old Testament saints knew, they could not have known that there was going to be a generation of saints that would not have to experience death, but they would still get their glorified bodies for all eternity. So the mystery is this. To the Old Testament saints who knew all of what we just looked at, but yet God had not revealed the mystery of the rapture of the church, 
those Old Testament saints, the question had to be, does that mean we all have to die in order to get our glorified bodies? And if you think about the things that they knew, that they did believe that there would be a literal, physical, bodily resurrection. And they knew there was a kingdom age coming in the future where life would be extended. But they also knew there was a persecution period coming where the saints of God would be massacred. Those Old Testament saints, they had to have wondered, does that mean that before we can get our bodies, we're all going to be destroyed? Now, I want to tell you that even today, living in the church age in which we live, there are some Christians who do not believe that the rapture, first of all, there are some who don't believe the rapture is literal, period. Literally going to be the Lord Jesus coming in the clouds and us caught up together with Him. There are some Christians, or folks who call themselves Christians, who don't believe the rapture is literal at all. There are others who don't believe that the rapture of the church is going to take place before the tribulation period. And in some respects, they're like the Old Testament believers who who didn't have the knowledge to understand or even see the rapture of the church. But the church at Corinth is not the only church to whom the Lord revealed that mystery. They're not the only church to whom the Apostle Paul was given permission to reveal the mystery. The most well-known passage about the rapture of the church is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You probably already know the verses by heart. Listen as I read them if you've forgotten them. Beginning in verse 13, Paul said, But I would not have you to be ignorant Brethren, and can I just say here, ignorance is not stupidity. Ignorance just means not yet knowing something. You know, I'm ignorant about how to work on cars like Brother Alex does, but that's not because I'm stupid, it's just because I don't have the knowledge to know how to do it like Brother Alex does. Now, he might think I'm stupid sometimes too, but that's different than being ignorant. Ignorant just means not knowing something, Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. In other words, I want you to understand this. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Paul said, I don't want you to worry about those that are already dead. Let me tell you something. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again... Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. I have to tell you, for those who believe in a rapture, but they believe it's not before the tribulation period, but after the tribulation period, I think that's the very reason that God led the Apostle Paul to include that 18th verse, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. There wouldn't be a whole lot of comfort to me if I believed that as a believer I was going to have to go through the tribulation period before I could get raptured out of here. But rather the comfort comes from knowing the same thing that John said to the church at Philadelphia when he was recording the message from God in Revelation chapter 2. Three, that God promised that those would not have to walk through the fires of the tribulation, through the testing of the world which would come, but they would be taken out of the world. There's the comfort. 
that I won't have to go through the tribulation. He's going to save his bride from having to go through it. But this is the, the rapture. The word rapture is not in the passage, but it's Jesus appearing in the clouds and catching up believers to meet him in the air and taking us on to glory. And the Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that means when he comes back, at the end of the tribulation, we're coming back with him. Because it said, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherever he goes, that's where I'm going. When he comes back, I'm coming back. When he's here for a thousand years, I'm going to be here for a thousand years. You want to talk about an interesting situation, there are going to be people like me and you that have already left this world and died once and gone on to heaven. We're going to be coming back with him and we're going to be here during the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth walking around with people that have, are still in their first life. That's going to be an interesting situation, no doubt. The Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherever He is, that's where I'm going to be. But those Old Testament saints, they didn't see the rapture of the church. They knew there was going to be a bodily resurrection, and they knew about the coming persecution, tribulation, and they knew about the coming kingdom age after that, but they didn't see the rapture. They didn't know of the rapture, so to them, they had to have assumed the only way I'm going to get my glorified body is for this body to be killed. That's what they had to have assumed. And Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC was not the only person in history who has given them reason to assume that, by the way. There have been many others throughout history who have tried to totally annihilate the children of Israel as the people of God. That was one of Satan's plans until the Messiah was born, was to make sure that the Messiah couldn't be born through the line of Abraham like he was promised. But even since Jesus was born, there has been one attack after another by Satan to try to destroy the remnant of Israel that's left. I know the one that always comes to your mind. We're thinking of Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s, who supposedly tried to annihilate, round up all the Jews that were in Europe and, and exterminate them. The so-called Holocaust. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been a student of history my whole life. I've read a whole lot of information with a lot of the, the facts and the data on that story. I'm going to tell you, I do not believe that all of the numbers they've given about Hitler supposedly killing 6 million Jews, I think the numbers are exaggerated. I'm just being honest with you. Historically, I don't think that's mathematically possible. That's not discounting the fact he was trying to kill Jews. He was trying to kill a lot of other people too along the way. But there's an example of someone who is trying to exterminate the Jews. You don't read as much about it in the history books because they were supposedly on the same side as the Allies in World War II. But Joseph Stalin and the communists killed more Jews in Russia than Hitler ever thought about killing in Germany. Stalin killed somewhere between 10 and 15 million Jews in the Soviet Union. So there again, Satan has been trying to destroy the remnant of the seed of Abraham since way, way after Antiochus Epiphanes had 40,000 Jews killed in three days' time in 168 B.C. And there are others in history too. The Pharaoh of Egypt at the time that Moses was born. Remember he issued the decree for all male Hebrew children under the age of two to be killed. Then there was Herod at the birth of Jesus who issued the exact same proclamation. 
for all male Hebrew children under the age of two to be killed, massacred, slaughtered. Because Satan has been attacking the seed of Abraham all the way back to Abraham. So those Old Testament saints, surely when they knew about the bodily resurrection and getting a glorified body for all eternity, they had to have assumed there's going to come a time when we're just all going to have to go through that tribulation period, a time of trouble such as never was. We're all going to be annihilated, massacred, wiped out in order to get our glorified bodies. We're just going to have to accept that's what it's going to take. But here's the beauty of it. Paul said, no, let me show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We're not all going to have to go through death, but we're still going to all get a brand new body. Now, friend, I don't know if I'm going to still be alive when that day comes or if I'm going to already be buried out back with the Methodist here in the cemetery. I don't know. But I can just tell you, it excites my soul to know that whether it's me, uh, my son, or some other generation of Christians coming after me, there's coming a generation of Christians that won't have to go through the tribulation, won't have to taste of death, but they're still going to get their glorified bodies right along with the rest of us. Amen? And if that doesn't excite your soul, thinking that you might be one of the ones that doesn't have to experience death, but you're still going to get your glorified body. There are not going to be any second-rate citizens up in heaven. We're all going to get that glorified body. We shall all be changed. I don't have time to read all of 1 Corinthians 15 when it describes how, how our body is going to be changed. Go back and read it this afternoon. That'll excite you. you. You might even have a shouting fit right there at home when you see how God's going to take this, this body and change it into a new body. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. If that's not something to make you want to get out there and serve God and motivate us to live for Him, I don't know what else is going to do it. To think of what He's put in place for us. Whether you're buried out back with the Methodists or whether you're still walking around, we're all going to be changed and get that brand new body. Paul said, I show you a mystery. All those saints before then had no idea of what beautiful thing God had planned for the generation that would see His return in the clouds. All the things that are going on in this world today, folks, point to the possibility, I would even say, yea, a likelihood, that it could be in our generation. Are you living like you're going to see Jesus face to face? Can I just tell you whether you're here when the rapture takes place or not, there's coming a day where if you're saved, you're going to see Him face to face. Will you be ashamed and embarrassed of how you lived as a Christian after getting saved? Or will you just be glad to see Him because you lived for Him with all you had in you? Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet, please, with heads bowed and eyes closed? Miss Mary, if you'll come and prepare to play a hymn of invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord Jesus, for the Beautiful, beautiful promise of the rapture of the church. For the mystery that you revealed to Paul and gave him permission to reveal to us that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Lord, we're excited about eternity with you. Thank you for all you've done for us. Dear God, I pray that this morning that anyone here listening to this message whether they're here or somewhere else, if they're listening, dear God, I pray that if they don't know for sure they're saved and on their way to heaven, that this morning would be the, the day they make sure. And for those that are already saved, dear God, may we be excited, reinvigorated, to think that we may be the generation that would not have to sleep, but will still 
be changed. Lord, help us to live like today is the day. Help us to live like there's not a tomorrow. Not in in worldliness and fleshliness and sinfulness, but in giving our all for you. Dear God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, Miss Mary, if you'll begin to play whenever you're ready.